subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Here we are welcoming one of the most beautiful panelists or speakers that we have had on the speaking webinars so far. Uh, please welcome uh, Ms. Radhika Gupta. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Radhika, for joining us uh, today. Such a pleasure and an absolute honor to be talking to you. I was telling Radhika a little while earlier that I have my two girls as well, and I was uh, showing everything about Radhika in the past uh, one week to my uh, to my daughters, uh, setting uh, a very high benchmark for them to look up to. So thank you, Radhika, for joining us. And uh, would you like to start with a very quick introduction of your very, very illustrious journey that you've taken? Oh, God, quick. And thank you so much for having me. Always a delight to do these kind of things, uh, especially it's a good way to end a Friday evening, light way to end a Friday evening. Uh, what do I tell you about myself? Um, I am a working girl like uh, many of us uh, are, uh, trying to uh, manage uh, home and work and uh, some dreams. I uh, have a slightly uh, twisted background as a kid because I grew up, I'm the daughter of an Indian diplomat, uh, very close to my identity, grew up uh, six countries, four continents, uh, born in Pakistan and then uh, lived in Africa for quite some time, Nigeria, Zambia, uh, also went to high school in Italy and uh, then moved to the US uh, and uh, worked there, saw 2008 financial crisis and came back to India in 2009 to set up a business, uh, was young and 24 and wanted to do something on my own, didn't think it through, but did that, uh, sold the business to an organization called Edelweiss Financial Services. And uh, now I'm the CEO of their mutual fund business. I've been the CEO for the last three years. Uh, and that's essentially me. Fantastic. So before we, you know, we, we, we latch on to some of the points that you mentioned, you know, coming back in right after the, uh, the last recession that we've seen uh, uh, financially, and uh, coming back to India at, at nearly the peak of your career alongside uh, a few of your colleagues, we'll, we'll delve a little deeper into that as we move forward and also the mutual funds uh, space uh, itself. But, but take us through your early years, uh, Radhika, entering the workforce. How was that experience? How did your initial successes or challenges come about? And how did you overcome them to becoming one of the youngest leaders this country has seen? So early years are, uh, and actually I think the more interesting ones, uh, because for many of us, and I guess in my generation also, I don't come from a background where parents have been in corporate India or corporate US. Uh, so I started my career graduating from London uh, and uh, I was actually fairly clueless about what the world was ahead of me. I mean, I've had classmates who joined college were very clear about what they wanted to do and that, you know, when I graduate, I want to join Morgan Stanley Investment Banking in LA doing this. And I was like, I don't even know what Morgan Stanley is. Um, and I think that comes from the fact that, you know, one doesn't come from a corporate background. So I think the early years, I actually did a bunch of stuff. So I did my first two internships at Microsoft. So that was technology. And uh, then I joined uh, McKinsey. Uh, I think that story is somewhat documented. Uh, but uh, a pretty hard struggle to get into management consulting despite being a class topper. I mean, in the early years, you know, the smaller things get to you. Like, I think I was a pretty bad interviewer in my very, very early years. I mean, obvious lack of self-confidence, uh, just about how one looks and about, you know, being an introvert. And I think that all, you know, shows up in your conversations and interviews. So I think I was a terrible interviewer, I have to say, uh, and that didn't serve me well. Um, but I did uh, a year and a half at McKinsey and a few years uh, on Wall Street. Um, and it really was about finding my own space and figuring out what I liked and what I wasn't good at. What I always tell young people is that, you know, in your early years, I think it's, you're taught in college to associate yourself with great brands. Now, whether it's Wharton or McKinsey or anything else or Wall Street. Um, but it's also important not just to collect degrees on your resume, but to collect interesting experiences. Um, I always say that if there was one advice I would give my younger 21 year old self, it would be to chase experiences because at that stage, you really just want to learn and assimilate the most that you can. And you want to have different, different kinds of experiences. I mean, I think the one thing I like about my resume is that over the last 15 years of WorkX, there's been India experience and then there's been US experience. There has been startup experience and mid-sized company experience and larger company experience. There's been public sector and private sector. So I think 
collecting different kinds of experiences even within the same domain in my view was very very powerful and that's kind of what my early years taught me interesting so if i if i if i you know uh, and that's very interesting point perhaps uh, perhaps still relevant in a lot of ways you know when when i went to my b school or or or, or you know all this or everybody who comes out of a b school the first preference is management consulting right why do you think is management consulting such a preferred uh, option when you actually see there are a lot of people who just probably you know exit in the very first few years uh, and 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 then of course they they end up making a much bigger uh um uh, taking a much bigger leap and much bigger risks so why is management consulting such a coveted position right after school it's not just management consulting it's actually management consulting and financial services both and you're right i mean these are glam jobs out of business school now the fact is that when you're recruiting for a job on a business school campus nobody tells you you know nobody has any idea what they're doing i am convinced and i love the financial services profession i mean i've been in this industry for 15 years i'm very grateful for it but i don't think people join it out of love i think people join it for the glamour and the money to be very honest uh, and i don't think a lot of people survive because in any industry if you don't like what you're doing money can't carry you through i mean i've seen that with my own classmates a lot of the people who join financial services don't end up actually hanging out in financial services for a very long time um i think management consulting people join because it's a generalist profession one uh, you know and it is a launch pad for many other things now what i loved about my experience at mckinsey is more than the work the kind of people that i got to interact with so i think that's very valuable and in management consulting i think you grow up very fast so you know you're 21 22 and you're talking to ceos or department heads etc and you get an access and exposure and i think it shapes you in a way uh perhaps very young in your career so i mean management consulting is supposed to be the start to a ceo journey but i don't think that's true i think you you know rise to leadership regardless of how you choose to start your path but i do agree there's a lot of glamour associated with these professions and i have to dispel the notion of glamour after i joined mckinsey and i was i thought you know i'm going to be sitting in a boardroom designing strategy and it's going to be all white smoke and stuff my first client was the equivalent of chroma in the us and it was in texas and it was an electronic retailer going bankrupt um and we were on a cost cutting project and if anyone knows electronic retail uh then you know the busiest times for a retailer are actually the weekend so we worked all weekends all holidays like thanksgiving is the biggest day for an electronic retailer and humko monday ko chutti milti thi and like monday ki chutti ka kya point hai yaar abhi i come back from texas to new york on monday and i'm like hi to my friends let's go meet and everybody is back to work um and i used to work 18 hours a day from 5 in the morning when the warehouse opened till 10 at night when the cash register closed following people around and documenting what people were doing that was my first job and while i'm very grateful for the mckinsey experience i would just say that your first job is not the glamour that business school presents it to you so uh, if i were to look at you know the the current situation you know uh, the way uh, the economy the economic implication of of what is happening right now is 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 panning out there'll be a lot of i mean uh, complete uh, tectonic shifts in the in in the hiring and the and the manpower space so if I, if you were talking and you know a lot has been talked about the millennials the way they treat a career their definition of a career and you know uh, resigning at the drop of a hat or you know taking whims and fancies etc what would be your say three recommendations to a 22 year old you at this uh, situation at this juncture if you were 22 what would be your two, three recommendations who's entering into the workforce i think this is a really nice question deepika and i am also someone who manages millennials and it's something and i'm going to answer these sort of on the fly but it's something i grapple with and i've been thinking a lot about and i don't want to i think millennials are super smart so i don't want to sound dismissive in any way i think the first thing that you have to keep in mind is that you can't constantly be switching jobs and you see that with millennials a lot you know i mean you have a bad six month period your boss says something you have one bad year of compensation i'm looking for a job switch i want to tell you something that i think the head, head of goldman sachs india told me is that to have a long sustainable career a rock star out of the words career you almost need to go through prolonged periods of hell prolonged periods of hell is the word and i think that is it you have to give time to the 
organization. So that will be my first advice uh, to millennials. My second advice would be to them is that, you know, you have to control what you can control and constantly keep upgrading yourself. Now, this is not just advice to millennials, it's advice to everybody. But you are not perfect on day one. So if your boss is not perfect, please remember you're also not a perfect boss. There are good things about you. There are bad things about you. And now the bad things about you, I'll give you my own experience. Shortly before I became CEO, I had run a successful business, but I did realize I had no people management experience because my team size was seven people. I mean, today I managed 200. Um, take on, find out what those gaps in your resume are. They could be gaps just because you never had the opportunity. And now work on those gaps. Never stop being a student. So if your gap is public speaking, you're not too old to learn public speaking. You can learn it at the age of 30 or 40. You can definitely learn it at the age of 22. If your gap is people management and there will be a time, then ask for those opportunities. But constantly keep working on yourself, I think is my second advice. Yes. Um, and I think the third one is that, listen, great careers are not built in an instance. And they are not all glamour. Um, you know, every job, including the job at the top of the totem pole and at the bottom of the totem pole, even though I don't believe this totem pole thing, has a fairly... So I get told my job is fairly glamorous, especially the MFC CEO role, because it's very public and you get to do fun things like this and go on TV and you do all that stuff. But there is an equally unglamorous side to that job that is tough and there are... There's probably a day a month where you feel like quitting and giving it all up. And those days are also a reality. So it is about living through those days. So balance the glamour that business school tells you with the reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, so, so great. I mean, now let's, uh, that, that takes me to my leading uh, phase of the discussion, uh, Radhika. You've been, you're such a young uh, leader who has shown massive agility um, through different phases of, uh, of transition, uh, transitioning your business, you're being an entrepreneur and then transitioning into a, uh, a leader of such a massive organization, you know, from the, the 200 crores to the, to the, to the 20,000 uh, uh, 20, crore uh, fund. So that journey, take us through that journey, you know, take us through some of the lessons that you would give uh, to organizations today, which would be timeless, uh, whether, you know, it comes to whether it is about people, business organizations, and then of course, I'll come to a larger point of scale, you know, how you moved uh, from one step to the other? Did you take baby steps? Did you take big risks? What did you do? So, so let's hear from you on, you know, maybe about four, uh, three to four different lessons that you would share with the leaders of today. That's it. And, you know, my journey, I mean, it's in two parts. You know, there's an entrepreneurial journey of forefront capital management, which was, I would say, the 25 lakh to 200 crore journey. And then there's a larger journey at Edelweiss that has been now what, 20, 30,000 crores or wherever we are. Um, and I do, you know, I want to take to the last thing you said that for me, every journey, the greatest journey is a step by step journey. I have a very firm belief that you don't go from one to 100 in life. You never. You can dream of, so you should always dream. So like right now, my dream is 3 lakh crores. Okay, so that's the dream. I'm sitting at 30,000 crores. So there's a dream that is 10 times. Uh, and three years ago, we were probably three, 4,000 crores. So it was a really big dream. So it's important to have big dreams because if you don't have big dreams, then you're not going to get anywhere, right? But you also have to plan in shorter chunks. So I always say that you don't go from 1 to 100. You go from 1 to 2. And then at two, you know, you get a little more confident and you have the ability to go to five. And at five, you are able to plan for 10 and 15. And in that journey, you acquire the wisdom. By the time you're at 15, 20, you can plan for 50. And that's how you get from 50 to 100. So one to 100 is a gradual journey. Um, and I think that is super important. That's what I've always found. So while there's a lot of strategic planning, etc., that happens, I think a lot of life is about ground execution. I believe in a country like India, so much is achieved just by execution. You know, um, I was just having a conversation with my head of HR and he was complimenting us for some of the very good work we've done on the marketing front in the lockdown. <coughs> and he said, for you guys, it's actually sometimes just the ability to get the email out and execute the event on time and have the speaker. And sometimes it may not be perfect. It's 85% there, but you put a plank on the ground. And then the next time you execute something, 
85 becomes 95 percent perfect and you're at 99 that, yes that ability to execute in india is grossly underrated because you see so many people with ideas and i think india is just so much about ground of execution i mean that's my i didn't put out four things but that's my number one learning over this uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're running a 25 lakh business or a 200 crore business so let me ask you a leading question on that uh, uh, radhika i mean uh, uh, being such a young ceo i'm sure you've taken uh, a lot of steps very very fast because to to get to that level must have taken a, a a bunch of uh, steps. Now, I think one more question. When you talk about execution, and I, I see that, I mean, being an entrepreneur myself, I see that execution. I mean, uh, as it is said, no, we have a lot of gyanis. You know, gyan is a lot. 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 So how do you manage that problem? How do you manage that challenge when you get execution done? So I have believed that leadership is about being very hands-on. And I think uh, execution is a culture that comes from the top. I will give you an example of something that's concrete, and that's a large-scale project. One of the largest bets in our journey, we raised about 12,000 crores last year through Bharat Bond, which was a government of India initiative. Um, you know, obviously, it's a career highlight for me. Um, and you know, people have told us that Bharat Bond was product designing brilliance and this and that and all. And so they, it's hard execution, yeah. I mean, if I had to tell you, I took 50 flights to Delhi last year myself. No, 50 trips, 100 flights to Delhi myself. We prepared 700 documents to get this product through the cabinet ministry. And I think that is ground up execution. I do believe ground up execution starts with me. So I have seen during times of Bharat Mohan, when my team was stuck, I was ready to jump in. Now, I don't jump in for day-to-day -day sales or regular stuff, but if we're leading a really big project that has to get executed in time, then I have to jump in. And if my, if my team knows I'm committed to execution, I'll tell you the whole system will be committed to execution. I mean, it was super interesting. Bharat Mohan needed the approval from cabinet, uh, the union cabinet to be launched. And... Um, it also couldn't be launched towards the end of December because of the Christmas New Year period. And we were supposed to get cabinet approval sometime in mid-November. And then that kept getting delayed, delayed, delayed. And it was like one day they told us we'll get it on 4th December, but you still should try and launch it. And we had, I mean, Christmas holidays start like 18th. So we were like, if we get approval on 4th, will we be able to take a fresh product to market in a few days? But we could because we planned it so well. And I think that is ground up execution. So I think most things in India are 20% good ideas and 80% ground up execution. And leadership is a contact sport. I mean, it is found, it is fought in the battlefield. It is not fought in the boardroom. I love that. Leadership is a contact sport. Yes, it is. Absolutely, it is. So uh, I'll ask you another leading question. You know, we, and, and, and you know, because this is becoming uh, leadership's biggest challenge today. How do you drive your people? But driving also begins with hiring the right people. So mm -hmm. when you built uh, your, you built your seven member team at, at one point of time, you have a 2200 member team currently. How, what do you look for in people, especially people who would impact, uh, who will have the maximum impact are sitting at the top of the ladder? So I have to tell you, uh, you know, it was, it was tough hiring in a startup. It was even tougher hiring in my, uh, role as CEO because we were like a 30, they're, they're about 45 different companies in India when I took over we were 36 rank and I remember we were supposed to hire for these sales managers in Bombay so I went to MCA at that point in time and my HR told me all these interviews have been set up so I go sit in MCA and waiting these candidates don't show up they just don't show up like I'm supposed to be the CEO here and I'm trying to hire a live sales manager in Bombay and okay one candidate doesn't show up so you think Chalo, the second guy doesn't show up you realize that nobody wants to work with you because of the size of the business you manage. And I don't come from the MF industry, so nobody knew who I was. Now, three years later, I have confidence that I can hire anybody I want to. But So I think hiring is a, it's a lot about selling your story. In fact, I have always said in the first interview, it is very two-way. I'm selling the story as much as they are selling who they are. I mean, I think it's a two-way conversation even now. Obviously, now people show up for interviews, so they're much nicer. 
I look for two things in people. I have been told I'm the easiest person to interview with. I mean, my HR tells me this because essentially I start my interview. I don't ask anything technical because I assume if you've come to talk to me, my team has already interviewed you and you are technically qualified. So I ask one question, which is tell me about yourself. And that's my opening question. And your whole interview could be tell me about yourself. Now, it is a very leading question, but I feel in that single question, I can gauge nearly everything about a person. I can gauge your ability to tell a story, your ability to present yourself in front of me. I can gauge your energy. I can gauge your ambition. I can gauge your hunger. I can gauge if you're humble or if you're arrogant. I can, a lot of stuff. I can gauge if you are rambling or if you're precise. A lot of stuff comes out in that. So that's, that's, that's been my approach. And I look for two things. I mean, the secret sauce with me is very simple. It's two things. One, I look for tremendous hunger and energy. Um, I have said no to super bright candidates just because they, I felt they were sleepy. Now, I'm, a, I'm an energetic person. I'm told that I want people who are hungry and I want people who are energetic. And that to me is sort of uncompromisable. So I look for that in an interview. I can feel that energy. And in UP, they say that they don't to eat food. And I think that for me is very important. And the second is, I like people who are not victims of their current circumstances. Uh, no matter where you are today, in your head, I think you should think like number one. Because at rank 36 and at rank 16, I think like number one. Now that is important. So you can't be a victim of your current circumstances and you should be open, open to change. So you should be open to new ideas. Like I hate people who tell me SI hi hota hai. East industry mein to SI hi hota. That to me is like a no. Because the world is changing and even pre-COVID it was changing. But especially if you're working as a young person in a business, you're a challenger. You've got to be audacious. You've got to have something. So that I think to me is very, very important. I mean, someone was asking me on a previous conversation. And if I had to pick one word of all in the dictionary, what is my favorite word? And so I thought about it actually. And my favorite word, which is what I look for in people is chutzpah. Um, chutzpah, chutzpah, it's a Yiddish word, but it essentially means like this audacious confidence to just go out there and, you know, take over. So that, that's what I look for people in people, chutzpah. Excellent. Excellent. I'll ask you one leading question. I'll, I'll, I'll take this, this point forward. Uh, you mentioned when you interviewed at McKinsey, 85% of your time. Uh, went into, or rather, eighty-five minutes of your time went into talking about bridge that you used to, that you used to play with your, your your parents. So, in today's world, when you interview, you know, and 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 say if you look if you look at entrepreneurs or new time businesses or business uh, leaders, when they interview, you know, the pressures and the, the whole, you know, the ecosystem is so driving. So, if somebody else somebody starts talking about bridge or football, you are doomed. Like, boss, what will you do? You know, so how, how do you draw a parallel today? And uh, what, what would be your message to those who are hiring to look for? So I think, you know, hiring is a very personal decision. And ultimately, you know, you were taught this in college, but I never believed it. Hiring is about fit. Now, you know, what works for me doesn't have to work for you. I absolutely understand. Because if I'm a high energy person, I need a high energy person around me. If I'm not a high energy person, a high energy person around me is going to be draining and miserable. So I don't think hiring the same standards have to apply uh, to everybody. And I think everyone interviews very, very differently. I will tell you though, you know, I have done conversations. I've also been hired. I've been a candidate in the past. I think more and more senior conversations are not interviews. I think they become conversations. Um, and whether those conversations travel to bridge or whether they travel to cooking or whether they travel to anything else, I think those conversations are conversations and the conversations go in any direction that you really take them. Um, so I think hiring is very, very personal, but I really think that as you get see, I mean, no conversation I have had in hiring a person has said, Chalo, walk me through your resume. But I've seen your resume, right? I mean, if it today is digital age, I need someone to walk me through their resume. I mean, the worst answer to tell me about yourself is, I worked here, then I worked here, then I worked here, then I quit this, then I did this, then my father did this. Right? 
you have to tell me about the qualities that stand out in you what are you bringing to me and how those qualities manifest so one of the things that and i don't i haven't done too many interviews because i haven't changed jobs very much but one of the ways that i like to describe my own self in conversations is i'm a child of chaos i mean i thrive in chaos uh, I, my background is one like that i, I moved to different countries and uh, you know that's been my work career i've done a lot of changes i've moved into a lot of different situations and i've tried to make the best of each one so that's how i describe myself um, so i don't think the self description is also x to y to z i mean that is my first turn off great so radhika as we as we approach you know the closure of our conversation uh, i i wanted to ask you uh, one uh, one 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 very critical question which is uh, which is coming in front of all leaders i think as a leader it's not just the the you know the uh, the internal dynamics it is also external dynamics in your brand as a leader how the world the industry perceives you and looks at you looks up to you i mean you've been a leader who's not just limited to uh, to edelweiss or or you know to the mf industry or to the financial industry also there are people outside the industry who are looking up to you and talking to you and here we are you know we we, we found you stopped you and, and and got to talk to you today so how would you recommend so one is that how important of course brand is extremely important today for corporate leaders yeah. how do you build a brand as a corporate leader and then and and what are the activities that go into it is it personal is it institutional how do you build it so i find it funny that i'm asked this question because i am more frequently so it's interesting that you ask because while i'm in a business that's very marketing etc as have when i was hired into this role i was told that one of the reasons i would not make it to a ceo role is that i know nothing about marketing and branding so i find it kind of nice that i am asked this question even though i am not a marketing expert at all i you know i i'll tell you something about i think personal brand is super important and i think it's becoming in a more important word you know we call it personal brand today in the old days it was called reputation and if you don't think personal brand is important well reputation was always important it's now got this tag of personal brand um and i think you know i something my father taught me as a leader why is personal brand important because you are also an ambassador my father carried the tag ambassador yogesh gupta through his career ambassador of india he used to say bharat ka rajdoot hu i am the representative of president of india i mean that that is his role um mm-hmm. and i think you are as a ceo or as a leader the representative of the organization good or bad in the way you conduct yourself will reflect on the organization uh, if you build a brand that is warm and likable the positive effects on the organization are immense i mean i have experienced that so much um you know uh, i tell you uh, something like girl with a broken neck which is the video that released 2 years ago uh you know i got so much personal affection from it but the brand gets a lot of affection from it and now we've sort of built a brand also around storytelling and being an honest and young brand so i think if you can marry your own brand with the brand of the organization one it becomes very powerful secondly i think this is an age where it is not difficult to sort of build out your brand you know in the old days branding was a very expensive exercise that was left to corporates now in the age of social and digital media what do you have to do to build a personal brand essentially you need to stand for something and you need to know what that is and you need to be able to articulate that well and you have so many forums you have blogs you have twitter you have linkedin to be able to articulate that um and i think if you can articulate that you will find more and more people connect to you it's a tremendous way to network i mean the kind of people i have connected to on social media there are amazing stories i just interviewed today um someone who is a reasonably famous investor sitting in the us and i swear i only found him on twitter and i sent him a message on twitter and he said he had seen my video and he liked me so he'd be more than happy to do anything for me mm-hmm. this happened solely because i sent the guy a message on twitter um and i think you know i've had job offers come through this way also so i think personal brand can be incredibly powerful it's not that hard to build either agree absolutely so like you build very very beautifully i'll ask you one last leading question and then we will move to taking questions from the audience is radhika you talked about being a warm and likable brand how do you build that amidst all your leadership pressures how have you kept such a warm and likable position ah uh, hopefully likable but i think the thing to do is be yourself 
um it really it's the simplest advice but my god it's the easiest thing to do because and you know being yourself is something that is not tested in good times it is tested in tough times your brand i was i heard this i think pralad takkar told me this he said you know you are actually not building a brand in good times in good times you're just marketing a brand you're building the brand in bad times so i'll give you an example if you are asked a tough question as a leader how you answer it shapes your personal brand can you answer that question with honesty uh, if you are going through a bad patch as a leader do you have the confidence to go out and tell your team listen i am going through a bad patch i need help or are you screaming at everyone and grappling with it internally how you conduct yourself in the bad times i think is the best way to communicate your brand um so i think i try to be honest i try to be myself and i also try to share uh, you know the challenge of the ceo tag is that people look at the tag and think of you as like the suited person or the sari clad person in a corner office that is very inaccessible i've tried to share a lot of stories i mean i am a huge believer in the power of storytelling i tried to make me and the brand a lot more real by sharing a lot more stories mm. fantastic so thank you very much radhika for that i think uh, time now that uh, we took questions from the audiences i have anjali yadav ask uh thank you ms gupta it's great listening to you you started in finance when it was not so favorable for women uh do you feel the situation has improved and what can we expect in future aren't many names i don't know if it's improved uh i think it should improve but the fact is that if you look at most industries today not just finance with the exception of maybe media and a couple of others there are very few of us and there are very few of us at the top now i often get asked what you should do to solve for more women in leadership i don't even think you should try and solve for more women in leadership because that's the output you have to solve for women not dropping out at the uh, mid level i do hope it will improve because now i see that in campus is campus hiring is in many places 50% women if you can cross the crucial mid stage i hope it will improve um i do have one advice you know since anjali asked that question and there's one thing you know i manage men and women there's one thing that i wish to tell everyone who listens to this and i say it every time i'm asked this women don't ask you know yeah women need to be ambitious and we just need to ask uh there's this great incident that i have to tell you about do you remember how the modi there was a time when modi went to visit trump in texas mm. um, and there was this big program and pomp and circumstance and everything happened and modi and trump were walking back okay and there's a bunch of folk dancers who were danced for them and they're both walking back like hugging each other as they always do and this line of indian dancers is there and after them there's an 11 year old boy in white clothes Yes. Now Modi and Trump walk, 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 and the dancers are looking. Now the boy, the boy is eleven, and he's like, I have to say, at least ten years older, younger than these girls. He taps Trump on the shoulder and says, "Can I have a selfie?" <sighs> and he gets the selfie. And all the women standing in line before him are like, "I can't believe he got the selfie." You know why he got the selfie? Well, he got the selfie because he asked. and it is very important to ask so please ask for that promotion please say you want to do more please ask for that extra compensation please ask fantastic lovely example so uh, the more questions coming in arjun asks what you said you thrive in chaos how do you develop a mindset that allows you to do that ah uh, for me it's been a little easier because of the background arjun because my father moved every 3 years and you know one of the things about the foreign services they don't just move you cities they move you countries and you move from very drastic countries so it's europe to africa europe to africa i tell you the one the two words that have really helped me and again in you know the format of a story that from my childhood um because i've also made a lot of career movements um so when i was young and i used to uh, go on these planes and we used to leave one country you know we would be at the airport and my brother and i would always be crying and so would my mother ke school chut gaya or office you know i mean we leaving our friends behind and our school behind yeah. and i would always remember my father boarding the flight to a new yeah. country and yeah. leaving a country he would never come back to like he never went back to nigeria or pakistan but he would always be smiling and that was a very distinct visual and i i would ask him why i think i asked him why when i was teenager and he said you know वो दौर चला गया एक नया दौर आएगा दे विल बी अ न्यू स्कूल न्यू फ्रेंड्स एक्सेट्रा एंड ही ऑलवेज टू से मूव फॉरवर्ड 
and he says that even now and i think move forward is something that i would tell all of you you know it is you have to stop looking at the past because it's not in your control one of the things that helped me greatly when i moved back from the us is i actually didn't go back to the us for 10 years after i moved back because people kept saying yeah you know you'll regret it and people ask you these questions do you regret moving back always tell those people you don't regret moving back even if you do because there are 10 people who will pull you down and say change is not something that humans like so they'll tell you oh you know you had it better in the past etc <laughs> don't make those comparisons resist the urge to make comparisons and the last piece of advice i'll leave you for change and i think i wrote a thread on social on this also is you know when you move from world 1 to world 2 and i i'll give you an example when i moved from the us to india someone gave me this advice that you know don't be that little kid who moves from the us and says everything in india is wrong like it's dirty the people are this respect the new environment you are moving into because you haven't made it here right people have and they've done a really really well here so don't be cynical about your new world embrace your new world and then it'll embrace you fantastic So Lauren asks, uh, why I think this is pretty much a question that we spoke about. But uh, uh, what story do you look for in a potential candidate uh, you are interviewing? So you talked about tell us, uh, tell me about yourself. What are you looking for? Oh, what story do I look for? Um, I look for an ability to challenge circumstances. I I love that. Um, I love someone who was maybe an underdog, um, but could challenge the circumstances. had persistence and had resilience um i love stories of people doing things that are new and a uh, big thinking in nature embracing more than their current role i love stories that uh, you know say that i often ask candidates an other question beyond tell me about yourself and i ask them that you know what do you want to be a few years down the line and it's like a, a very basic question and you know when i'm hiring a sales guy and most 90% of sales guys i'll talk to will never tell me they aspire to be a ceo and that is just like a red flag in my mind you want i want someone you know and then some guy will come and say but actually i aspire to be what you and that is what you want to hear you want to hear about someone who has ambition and aspirations so i love to see those stories i love to see growth stories fantastic fantastic we have one uh, quick two quick questions that i would take uh who has been your role model i mean i, I know you spoke a lot about your mom and uh, who do you follow for inspiration ah, there's not one i would say but there are different sets of people who have been role models i like to look at different individuals and take different things away from them i'll tell you a couple of people i really like sure. i love nandan nilikani's career um if i have to think about my own because i think he's contributed tremendously to uh 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 in process and then also contributed to government with his time and that's that's kind of how i would like to see my own career i love i currently love two people uh sanjeev mehta who is ceo of hul uh i i met him through a boardroom session and he's just warm and human and clear but he speaks in very simple terms and he's someone you know he knows how to warm, be warm to ceo and he knows how to be warm to a young fmcg distributor and i I love that ability that he has, um, and then I love Prime Minister of New Zealand Jacinda Ardern. Um, you know, she's thirty-nine, a young woman leader. Uh, you know, leading her country through crisis with a lot of boldness and a lot of heart and humanity. Uh, you know, some of the things I believe in about communication, telling stories, being honest with your people. Um, I think she emulates that really nicely. So these are the two, three people I currently really like. last question i'll pick up uh, radhika is what are you currently reading oh my god i read so many books i read like 50 books a year and i mostly read fiction i don't read self help books i don't understand them um so make fun of me for that but i read a lot of fiction and i read fiction from around uh, the world so uh, and i do a lot of currently i'm reading a book of poetry because i'm learning urdu so i'm reading this a uh, book of uh, faiz's poetry in translation so i'm reading the urdu and i'm reading the hindi so uh, that's what i'm currently reading but i read everything romantic so, novels african script everything 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 fiction i love so is there an author coming up in radhika gupta soon 
I want to write a book. I really want to write a book, and I'm hoping in ten years I will write a book. I hope sooner, but I want to. Fantastic! So Speaky looks forward to to launching that book together with you. <laughs> Thank you. So so fantastic, Radhika. I think we are drawing close to uh, uh, our, our conversation. Thank you very much for your time. It's been absolute pleasure having spoken to you. Uh, you are indeed an, uh, a warm and a very very likable leader. Stay that way. Keep inspiring. Thank you very much.